Thank you very much, John. Appreciate that introduction. It's good to have you all here again this afternoon to continue studying this very important series on the robe, the robe of life. Before we begin our study this afternoon, we do want to ask for the Lord's blessing. And so I invite you to bow your heads with me as we pray. Father in heaven, what a joy it has been to be in your presence. There is no better place to be on planet earth than in your presence. And Father, we ask that as we open your holy word this afternoon, that your Holy Spirit will be present through the ministration of the angels. We ask, Father, that you will give us clarity of thought and that you will give us willing hearts to receive the seed of truth. I ask, Father, that you will bless those who are watching on television, those who are listening on the radio. I ask that you will touch their hearts as well. And Father, we thank you for the privilege of approaching your throne in prayer. And we thank you for hearing us. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to begin this afternoon by reading a statement that we find in the Review and Herald, June 4, 1895. It's a statement written by Ellen White. And I'm sure you probably have read this statement before. Here, Ellen White inspired by God's Spirit, said this, The righteousness by which we are justified is imputed. That means credited to our account. The righteousness by which we are sanctified is imparted. The first, that is His imputed righteousness, is our title to heaven. The second is our fitness for heaven. You see, we need imputed and imparted righteousness. The imputed righteousness is our title to heaven. The imparted righteousness is our fitness for heaven. Now we're going to discover in our study this afternoon that these two Dimensions of righteousness can be distinguished, but they cannot be separated. It's like you can't separate a fountain from a stream. And so you can't separate imputed and imparted righteousness. Now let's review briefly what we've studied so far. We've studied mostly about Christ's imputed righteousness, that when the Lord leads us to repentance, we confess our sin, we trust and believe in Jesus Christ, and it's a faith that is dynamic and active, and we're baptized. Jesus takes His life and His death and credits these to our account, and God looks upon us as if we had never sinned. We are accepted in the Beloved. This is the imputed righteousness of Christ. But in our topic this afternoon, we want to study about the imparted righteousness of Jesus Christ, which flows from an experience of having the imputed righteousness of Jesus. You see, Jesus not only wanted to live for us, but Jesus also wants to live in us. Jesus not only wants us to be in Him, He wants to be in us. Jesus not only lived and died for us, but Jesus wants to live in us. Now some people say, no, righteousness that Jesus gives us is only imputed righteousness. I beg to differ. Because Scripture clearly tells us that the robe of righteousness does not only include Christ's imputed righteousness, but also the imparted righteousness of Christ that leads us to act right. Now allow me to read you a passage from Scripture. Revelation chapter 19 and verses 6 through 8. Revelation 19 verses 6 through 8. 
Here it's speaking about that great group that will eventually be in the kingdom singing praises to God. It says this, And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, as the sound of many waters, and as the sound of mighty thunderings, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice, and give Him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and His wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright. And now notice what that fine linen is. It says, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Interesting. What is the white linen? The righteous acts of whom? Of saints. Now, what John is trying to say, inspired by the Holy Spirit, is not that the righteous acts are ours. It is Jesus acting and living through us. It is still His righteousness. It is not our righteousness. Because we have no righteousness, whether it's imputed or imparted. And by the way, imparted righteousness is not meritorious. The meritorious righteousness is the righteousness that Jesus Christ imputes to us, and then as a result, we have imparted righteousness that leads to holy living. The Apostle Paul expressed it by saying, I don't live anymore. Jesus Christ lives in me. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. So if it's Christ living in me, then for whom is the glory? The glory is not for me. The glory is for Jesus who is living His life in me. Now allow me to read you an interesting passage from the book Christ's Object Lessons. Once again, the last chapter of Christ's Object Lessons where Ellen White describes this robe of imparted righteousness. Christ's Object Lessons, page 311 and 312. This robe, woven in the loom of heaven, has in it not one thread of human devising. Christ, in His humanity, wrought out a perfect character, and this character He offers to impart to us. Not only impute, but impart. She continues saying, By His perfect obedience, He has made it possible for every human being to obey God's commandments. Now the question is, how can this be done? Ellen White now explains. When we submit ourselves to Christ, there's the key, when we submit ourselves to Christ, the heart is united with His heart. The will is merged with His will. The mind becomes one with His mind. The thoughts are brought into captivity to Him. We live His life not our life, His life. And then she says, this is what it means to be clothed with the garment of His righteousness. See, we live His life. This is what it means to be clothed with the garments of His righteousness. It's still His, not mine. Then she continues saying, then as the Lord looks upon us, He sees not the fig leaf garment, not the nakedness and deformity of sin, but His own robe of righteousness, which is perfect obedience to the law of Jehovah. Amen. What a marvelous statement. Now the question is, how do we submit to Jesus? How is it that we can live the life of Jesus and enjoy fully His imparted righteousness? In order to understand this, we need to understand certain things about God's holy law. Now, I'd like to begin by asking, what is sin according to the Scriptures? Every Adventist knows the answer to that question. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 4, and I'm reading this from the King James Version, which I like the best in this case. It says in 1 John 3, 4, 
Whoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. And you know when we read that, immediately as Adventists, what comes to our mind is that sin is breaking the Ten Commandments written on tables of stone. But that's only part of the story. You see, as Adventists, we usually think of the Ten Commandments written on tables of stone. But the Ten Commandments are merely a written transcript of who God is in His person. And so if the Ten Commandments are a written transcript of who God is in His character and in His person, to transgress the Ten Commandments means to transgress against God who is reflected in the Ten Commandments written on tables of stone. Let me exemplify what I mean. One of my favorite national parks in the United States is Grand Teton National Park up in northwest Wyoming. Spectacular. I used to go there uh, every year when I was pastoring in Wyoming. They would send us pastors to preach up in the park to all of the tourists, Adventist tourists that came. And one of my favorite places there at Grand Teton is a location where you have these beautiful ragged mountains in the background and you have beautiful beautiful pine trees in the foreground and then you have a crystal clear lake and one of my favorite activities was to go real early in the morning when there was absolutely no wind and everything was calm and just sit there next to the lake and look in the lake at the perfect reflection of the mountains and the trees in that lake. And you know, I have pictures of that specific location. It's spectacular. But you know, this was when you had to develop pictures. Now you have digital pictures. But when you had to develop the pictures, I had them in hard copy form. And you know, even today, when I look at the picture, I don't know which side is up and which side is down. Because the reflection is so perfect that you don't know which is the original and which is the reflection. That is the relationship between God and His law. You see, the law is Jesus Christ in written form. And when we transgress the written law, we're transgressing against Jesus as a person. In fact, allow me to read you an interesting statement from Ellen White, Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 5, page 1131. This is a magnificent statement. She says, what speech is to thought, so is Christ to the invisible Father. That's amazing. God thinks and Jesus speaks the thoughts of God. And then she continues saying, He is the manifestation of the Father and is called the Word of God. God sent His Son into the world, His divinity clothed with humanity, that man might bear the image of the invisible God. He made, that is Jesus, made known in His words, His character, His power and majesty, the nature and attributes of God. And now comes the portion that I want us to particularly reflect on. She says, Divinity flashed through humanity in softening, subduing light. He, that is Jesus, was the embodiment of the law of God, which is the transcript of His character. What does embodiment mean? It means that Jesus is the law in living form. Jesus is the law in bodily form. He is the embodiment of the law of God. In other words, Jesus lived the law in His life. He was a living illustration of what the written law of God is. The written law of God is simply the reflection in the lake, so to speak, of Jesus and what He is in His person. Notice Psalm 40 and verses 7 through 8 where Jesus in a messianic passage is spoken about. Psalm 40 and verses 7 and 8. By the way, this is the Messiah speaking long before He was born. Then I said, Behold, I come. In the scroll of the book it is written of me. I delight 
to do your will, O my God. And your law is where? Is within my heart. So the law was actually incarnate in Jesus Christ. The written law, the Ten Commandments, were written in flesh. And Jesus lived out the Ten Commandments. You see, one of the problems that we have as Adventists is we have the tendency to think that sin means breaking a list of ten rules. That sin means breaking a law that is written on tables of stone. But Scripture makes it clear that sin is not only breaking commandments on tablets of stone, sin is against a person who is reflected in those Ten Commandments. Sin is personal. Let me give you some biblical examples of this. You remember the story of Joseph, right? How Potiphar's wife came to Joseph and tried to entice him into committing adultery. Let me ask you, if Joseph had committed adultery, would he have been broke, breaking the seventh commandment that says, Thou shalt not commit adultery? Yes. Would he have been breaking the commandment that says, Thou shalt not covet? Absolutely. But notice that when she tried to entice Joseph, Joseph didn't say, How could I do this and break the seventh commandment? How could I do this and break the tenth commandment? No. Notice Genesis 39 and verse 9. Genesis 39 and verse 9. Here Joseph is speaking, There is no one greater in this house than I, nor has he kept back anything from me but you, because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against the seventh commandment? That's not what it says. Sin against whom? Against you. Because when we break the written law, we're sinning against a person who is reflected in that written law. You know, when the plague of locusts fell upon Egypt, we find in Exodus chapter 10, verse 16, that even Pharaoh recognized that sin was not merely breaking a list of rules on tables of stone. He recognized that sin was against a person, God, because God is reflected in His law. He calls Moses and he says, I have sinned against the Lord God and against you. Once again, sin is against a person. And of course, you remember when Israel worshiped the golden calf, Moses went to the top of the mountain and he pleaded for the life of Israel because God had said, I'm going to wipe out these people and I'm going to choose another people that will be obedient to me. Moses interceded for Israel. And I want you to notice what God said to Moses. This is in Exodus 32, verse 33. And the Lord said to Moses, Whoever has sinned against me, I will blot him out of my book. By the way, had they broken the commandment, Thou shalt have no other gods before me? Had they broken the commandment, thou shalt not make any graven image? Absolutely. they broken the written law, but Jesus says, uh, but God says, whoever has sinned against me, I will blot out of my book. You remember the sin of Achan? When Israel entered the promised land that he took some gold and some silver and a pre precious Babylonian garment, you know, when he was finally discovered, notice what Achan had to say. By the way, had he broken the commandment, thou shalt not covet? Had he broken the commandment, thou shalt not steal, in the written law. Yes, but notice what Achan had to say. Joshua 7 and verse 20. And Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Ten Commandments. No. He says, I have sinned against whom? Against the Lord, God of Israel. And this is what I have done. His sin was breaking the Tenth Commandment. It was breaking the commandment, Thou shalt not steal. But the sin was against whom? Was against God because God is reflected in His law. His sin was not against a list of rules and regulations. His sin was against a person. Now you remember when David committed adultery and also for all practical purpose, purposes committed murder that David wrote um, Psalm 51. Even David understood that even though he had broken the seventh commandment, even though he had broken the sixth commandment that says thou shalt not kill, he realized that his sin was really against the Lord. And so in Psalm 51 and verse 4 we find these words of David written to God. 
against you. You only have I sinned. Who did David sin against? Only ten written commandments? No. Against you. You only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Let me give you one, a couple of final examples. Uh, one from the Old Testament and another from the New Testament on, on how sin is personal. It's against a person. When we break the written law, we're sinning against God as a person because God is original in His character in living flesh is what the Ten Commandments say. You remember Daniel's penitential prayer in Daniel 9, 10, and 11 where he's pouring out his heart to God, and he's saying, God, please fulfill your promise. After 70 years, restore your people to their land. And I want you to notice there's an interesting interchange of concepts in verses 10 and 11. Notice what it says. Daniel speaking to God in prayer says, We have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in His what? In His laws which he set before us by his servants, the prophets. Yes, all Israel has transgressed your law, notice, and has departed so as not to obey your voice. Therefore the curse and the oath written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out on us because we have sinned against him. So breaking the law, it says that they broke the law, it's mentioned twice, but at the end of verse 11, it says, we have sinned against whom? We have sinned against him, against the Lord. You remember the story of the prodigal son? Did he break the commandment that says, honor your father and your mother? You better believe he did. Did he break the commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery? At least his brother said that he went out with the harlots. So evidently he broke the seventh commandment too. And yet when he comes back home, he doesn't say, Father, I have sinned by breaking the, the, the commandment that says, honor your father and your mother. I have sinned, Father, by sleeping with harlots. What did he say? I have sinned against heaven and against whom? Against you. And I am no more worthy to be called your son. Are you understanding the relationship between God and his law? You see, God is the law in living form. Jesus came to this world, the law was written in his heart, the written law was in the tables of his heart, and therefore Jesus lived what the law is. You see folks, when we break merely a written code, stone is cold, inanimate, unfeeling, hard, when you break the Ten Commandments, the Ten Commandments cannot shed tears. And the Ten Commandments cannot say, I forgive you. Because the Ten Commandments are simply the reflection of who God is in His person. But when you sin, you do hurt the heart of God. God does shed tears. And God can say, I forgive you. Do you know, there's something that I've never been able to understand. And that is that there are many Christians who say that the law was nailed to the cross. Now allow me to read you an interesting statement from the book The Great Controversy where Ellen White is talking about the sin of the Jewish nation and the sin of the Christian world today. I used to read this and I thought that they were two different sins, but really they're the same sin looked at from different angles. Notice Great Controversy, page 22. The great sin of the Jews was their rejection of Christ. Did they claim to uphold the law of God? The, yes, they claimed to uphold the law, but they rejected Jesus, who is per, a personal reflection of the law. Now what about the Christian world? She continues saying, the great sin of the Christian world would be their rejection of the law of God, the foundation of His government in heaven and on earth. Interesting. The Jews upheld the law and they rejected Jesus. The Christian world claims to uphold Jesus and reject the law. And by the way, when you crucify the law, you're crucifying Jesus because Jesus is reflected in the law. 
So crucifying the law means crucifying whom? Means crucifying Jesus. You cannot love Jesus and crucify the law because the law is a reflection of who Jesus is. So when you crucify the law, you're really crucifying Jesus himself. You see, folks, the true Christian feels love and hatred at the same time. You say, now, wait a minute. You say the Christian feels love and hatred? Absolutely. Jesus did. Notice Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 9. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 9. Here it's speaking about Jesus, and it says, You have loved righteousness and hated what? Lawlessness. Same word, transgression of the law in 1 John 3, 4. Therefore God your God has anointed you with oil of gladness more than your companions. What did Jesus love? Righteousness. What did he hate? Lawlessness or the breaking of the law. Now Ellen White amplifies this love-hate idea concerning Jesus and us. You know, usually what we do is we love the sin and hate the sinner. But with Jesus, he hated sin and he loved the sinner. Not a selected message is volume 1, page 254. Never before had there been a being upon the earth who hated sin with so perfect a hatred as did Christ because he was the law in person. And the law of God and sin cannot live together. She continues saying, he had seen its deceiving, infatuating power upon the holy angels and all his powers were enlisted against it. But then, in the devotional book, This Day with God, page 279, she says, while he hated sin with a perfect hatred because he was the law in living form, he was the law in bodily form, incompatible with sin, she says, while he hated sin with a perfect hatred, he could weep over the sinner. You see, folks, sin is deeper than breaking a list of rules and regulations. Sin is more than just breaking the written law. Now, I'm not saying that it's not breaking the written law. But the written law is given because there are people to have relationships. Isn't it true that when we break the law, we break relationships? Notice Isaiah 59 and verse 2. Isaiah 59 and verse 2. Here, Isaiah the gospel prophet says, and God, he's actually quoting God, but your iniquities have separated you from your God. What, do iniqu what does iniquity do? It what? Separates us from our God, and your sins have hidden His face from you so that He will not what? So that He will not hear. And so when we break the law, what are we breaking? Relationships. Because the law describes perfect relationships. Let me ask you, what good would it do to say, thou shalt not kill if there's no one to kill? What good would it do to say, thou shalt not commit adultery if there's no one to commit adultery with? What good would it do to say, thou shalt not covet if there's no one uh, whose possessions or wife there is to covet? What good would it be to do to say, keep the Sabbath of the Lord if there was no Lord of the Sabbath? In other words, the law describes perfect interpersonal relationships. And when we break the law, we break our relationship with God because God is the personification of the law. Are you understanding me this afternoon? Amen. Let me give you an example so we can understand a little bit better. I grew up in the country of Venezuela. I lived there from the time that I was five till the time that I was 14. And I did all of my primary education at our Seventh-day Adventist school there in the city of Caracas. Colegio Ricardo Greenwich is the name of the school. And at that time, my dad was the conference president, the East Venezuela conference president. And the school where I studied, on the first floor was the school. On the second floor were the offices of the conference where my dad was president. And so once in a while, during recess, I would, uh, I would go up to my dad's office. After all, I, all I had to do was go up the stairs. 
And I, my dad was on a trip, and I would sit there in the chair uh, behind his desk, and I would put my legs up on the desk like I saw him do. And, you know, I, I played like I was president of the conference as I watched him do. And once in a while, I would go through the, the trash basket to, to see if there was anything interesting that the secretary had thrown away. Well, one day, I went through the waste basket, and I found an envelope. And the envelope had had, had a bill that was worth 20 bolivares. Now, that was uh, the dollar to the believer was three, do, uh, three believers and 30 cents per dollar. And at that time, it was a lot of money. This was in the early 60s. And, you know, I didn't usually see that much money. And now I knew that the secretary had thrown it there by accident. Nobody throws away uh, a bill like that. Uh, but, you know, um, even though I knew my conscience told me that uh, it was thrown there by accident, you know, I, I thought, well, finders, keepers, losers, weepers. <laughs> you know the saying, you know, if she didn't want to throw it away, why is it in the wastebasket? And I rationalized. And so I took the 20 believer bill and I found a friend of mine, you know, I didn't want to sin by myself, so I said to him, hey, would you like to have 10 bolivares for yourself? He says, yeah. He says, where did you get it? I said, I found it. He says, oh, great. So I changed the 20 believer bill, and each of us had 10. Now, during the recess, what would happen is they had all kinds of salesmen that would come outside the fence. They sold uh, sodas, uh, you know, we would call them pop up in Wisconsin. They sold pop, and they sold, uh, they sold, chips and they sold candy it just all kinds of stuff that you really shouldn't eat anyway and so we went out during recess and we were the millionaires there at the school we were buying pop and we were buying chips and we were buying candy we bought everything under the sun but of course the principal of the school was watching what we were doing he says where did these guys get so much money so he called us to his office and he says where did you get the money and then, you know, you always add one sin to another. I said, well, my mother gave it to me. He says, oh, is that the case? I'm going to call your mother. So, oh, oh, I was in trouble now. I didn't really think about it. And I said, no, no, you don't have to call my mother. He says, oh, yes, I'm going to call her. So he called my mother. Now, do you know what? I was sorry. Do you know what I was sorry for? That I got caught. And I was sorry because of the punishment that I was going to receive. Because I had broken the commandment, thou shalt not steal and thou shalt not covet. I had broken the written commandments. And I was really sad because I knew that I was going to be punished at school by being suspended for several days, which I was. And when I got home, I was going to be punished. I was repentant because of the results of my sin. Well, I got home that afternoon. I had a key very quietly. I went to the door to open the door with the key. And what do you know? When the door opened, there was my mother standing in the door. I expected to see her with a belt. I expected to get the punishment, but what I saw totally blew me away. My mom was, sit was standing there in the door, and there were tears rolling down her cheeks. And she could hardly talk. She said, son, this is, an, is not what we've taught you to do. I'm deeply disappointed in what you did. Folks, I would have liked to have had a thousand lashes and not see my mother crying over the sin that I had committed. And I made up my mind that day that because my sin hurt my mother, which, by the way, afterwards reflecting, I realized that it hurt God more than it hurt my mother, I made my decision that I would not steal any more. Not because I was afraid of the punishment, not because the law says thou shalt not steal, but because what I had done had hurt my mother and had hurt my God. Let me ask you, when a husband goes out and commits adultery, breaks the commandment that says thou shalt not commit adultery, as well as the commandment that says thou shalt not covet, let me ask you, does that hurt people? Does it hurt the spouse? Yes, it does. Does it hurt the children? It most certainly does. Does it hurt the church? 
it most certainly hurts the church. Does it hurt the individual himself? Absolutely. He doesn't feel like praying. Doesn't feel like witnessing. Doesn't feel like reading the Bible. Because his sin has separated him from God. Breaking the written law has broken a relationship with Jesus. When we go to the movie theater, and by the way, I found it unconscionable that some youth leaders in the Adventist church even take their young people to the theater to watch movies these days. It's incredible. When you go to the movie theater and you watch violence and you watch sex and cheating and lying and spiritualism, which everything is saturated with spiritualism these days, does that make you more like Jesus? Does that make you want to have a close, intimate relationship with Jesus? No, it makes you unlike Jesus. It's not only breaking the written commandments, but it's making you unlike Jesus Christ. And therefore, we should set it aside. You know, you take the Sabbath, for example. People think these days that they can do anything on the Sabbath. Does breaking the Sabbath affect your relationship with Jesus Christ? Why did God give us the Sabbath? Not so that we would be idle and not do anything and be miserable on the Sabbath. The purpose of the Sabbath is relationship. You know why I don't go to the store and buy and why I don't go to work and I do all, don't do all of these things? Because this is the time that I've set aside to enhance my relationship with Jesus. It's not because the fourth commandment says don't work on the Sabbath. It's because I'm too busy fellowshipping with the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you don't keep the Sabbath, when you break the Sabbath, you're not only breaking the commandment, you're breaking your relationship with Jesus because Jesus wants to have fellowship with you all day Sabbath. You see, folks, sin is transgression of the law, but it's transgression against God as a person because the law is a reflection, a written reflection of who God is. Reminds me of Adam and Eve. Were they repentant at first? Are you kidding? They tried to justify their sin. The woman that you gave to me, oh, the serpent that you made, if it hadn't been for you giving me the woman and the woman tempting me, I would be sinless. If it wasn't for the fact that you made that nasty serpent, I would be sinless. You're to blame, Lord, and the woman is to blame, and the serpent is to blame. Everybody is casting blame. When were Adam and Eve actually sorry for their sin? They were sorry for their sin when they had to sacrifice the first animal. And listen, that must have been torture because we're told in the book Conflict and Courage, page 22, listen to this, just the falling of a leaf. Ellen White says, As Adam wit witnessed the fast signs of decay in the falling leaf, and in the drooping flowers, he mourned more deeply than men now mourn over their dead. Imagine mourning over flowers and leaves that fall, and now they have to kill an animal, and then their creator says, that lamb represents me. Your sin is going to cause me to go. I'm going to bear your sin, and I'm going to suffer the terrible penalty do you think Adam and Eve now said, we don't want anything more to do with sin? Yes, because it hurt their beloved friend, their creator, Jesus Christ. I love the text in Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 10. Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 10, where it speaks about what happens when people catch a glimpse of Jesus, the Messiah, of the law in living color, of the law incarnate, if you please. It says there, and I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look on me whom they have pierced. What are they going to look at? Jesus whom they have pierced. They will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. You see, folks, the way that we overcome sin in our life is not by looking at the law but by looking at Jesus because when we look at Jesus we see absolute sinless perfection one that deserved life 
And then we see Jesus hanging on the cross, naked, decrepit, with wounds on different parts of his body. And we say, Jesus, why did this happen to you? Jesus says, because of your transgression of the law. Because your sins have made separation between me and you. Because I bore your penalty. And when I see that sin is personal, when I see that sin is not only breaking a list of rules and regulations, but it's actually sinning against the character of someone, I say, Jesus, I hate sin. And I love you. The reason why we're not overcoming sin is because we're looking at everything except Jesus. Now this reminds me about the experience of Simon Peter. There were two men who denied Jesus, Peter and Judas. Peter denied Jesus and he betrayed him. And he denied him how many times? Three times. And the last time he used profanity to deny his relationship with Jesus. And listen, it wasn't because Peter was afraid of dying. It wasn't because he was a coward and afraid of dying. Because just a short while before, he had taken out his sword and he was willing to defend the kingdom of Jesus with the sword. Do you know the real reason why Peter denied Jesus? The worst reason of all, he was embarrassed to be associated with Jesus. Allow me to read you Desire of Ages, that classic book on the life of Christ, page 712. If he had been called to fight for his master, he would have been a courageous soldier. But when the finger of scorn was pointed at him, he proved himself a coward. Many who do not shrink from active warfare for their Lord are driven by ridicule to deny their faith. Oh, so you were with that man, Jesus. Is that your Messiah? And he felt the scorn and the ridicule, and he denied Jesus the worst kind of treason against the Lord. But fortunately, Jesus had told Peter, this is found in Luke chapter 22, when you are converted. See, Peter wasn't converted. Jesus says, you are going to be converted. Now let me ask you, what was it that led Peter to be converted? Did he look at the Ten Commandments and say, oh, I've sinned against the Ten Commandments? No. Allow me to read you from Luke 22, verses 60 through 62, the story. It tells us the moment when Peter was converted. But Peter said, Man, I do not know what you are saying. Immediately while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Their eyes met. And Peter remembered the word of the Lord. How he had said to him, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And Peter went out and wept bitterly. What was it that led to the conversion of Peter? Looking at the law as a code or looking at Jesus? It was looking at Jesus Christ and what his sin had done to Jesus, his best friend. In the book Christ Object Lessons, page 154, we find these wonderful words describing the experience of Peter. She says, when the crowing of the cock reminded him of the words of Christ, surprised and shocked at what he had just done, he turned and looked at his master. At that moment, Christ looked at Peter, and beneath that grieved look in which compassion and love for him were blended. It was a grieved look, it says, but, but compassion and love for him were blended. Peter understood himself. When do we understand ourselves and the nature of sin? When our eyes meet the eyes of whom? Jesus! Peter understood himself. He went out and wept bitterly. That look of Christ's broke his heart. Peter had come to the turning point, and bitterly did he repent his sin, not the consequences, his sin. 
He was like the publican in his contrition and repentance, and like the publican he found mercy. The look of Christ assured him of pardon. So what was it that led to the conversion of Peter? Beholding Jesus and what his sin was doing to Jesus. Judas was the opposite. The Bible says that Judas repented, but do you know what he repented of? He repented of the consequences of his sin. You see, his plan backfired. You know, that this idea that it was the purpose of Judas to betray Jesus to death, it was not the purpose of Judas that Jesus should die. He was trying to pressure Jesus into escaping and proclaiming himself king. But when he saw that Jesus allowed himself to be arrested and mistreated and led to the cross, he said, my plan backfired. I didn't get what I wanted. And the evidence that he really did not intend to betray Jesus to death is in the fact that he went back and he threw the money and he says, I have betrayed innocent blood. And the Bible says that he went and he hung himself. What a difference between the death of Peter and the death of Judas. When Peter was going to be crucified, according to Acts of the Apostles, they were going to crucify him with his head up. He said, no, 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 I, I'm unworthy to die like my master. Crucify me with my head down. And the Bible tells us that Judas, who repented over the consequences of his sin and not what the sin did to Jesus, went out and he committed suicide. You see, folks, what God wants to do, what Jesus wants to do, is to write His law on our hearts and on our minds. You see, He wants the law to be embodied in us. He doesn't want the law simply to be on tables of stone and me comparing my life with the tables of stone. No, He wants to take the law and He wants to write it on the tables of my heart. He promises, first of all, to give me a new heart. Notice Ezekiel 36, verses 26 and 27. Ezekiel 36, 26, and 27. This is a wonderful promise. And by the way, this is an instantaneous work. The change of heart is instantaneous. And God does not do bypass operations. He does not do valve changes, or He doesn't put in pacemakers. He only does transplants. It says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. Notice, he says, I'll give you a new heart and then you'll perform what the law requires. I will give a new spirit within you and then he says, and as a result, you will walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. So God promises to take out our old heart and give us a new heart for the asking. But listen up. The writing of the law in our hearts is a process. A lifelong process once we have our new heart. Notice what we find in Jeremiah 31, verses 31 to 33. Beautiful promise. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in the same place that it was in Jesus. I will put my law where? In their minds. And write it where? On their hearts and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. God doesn't want the Ten Commandments only to be on tables of stone. He wants to write the Ten Commandments on the tablets of our hearts, like they were written in the tablets of the hearts of Jesus. Now the question is, how does God write the Ten Commandments on our hearts? The Apostle Paul has the answer. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18, the more time we spend with Jesus in prayer, the more time we spend with Jesus in Bible study, the more time we spend telling about Jesus, the closer we draw to Jesus because we are beholding Him. By beholding Him, we are changed. That's how His life becomes our life. That's how His character becomes our character. And by the way, this is revealed in the holy place of the sanctuary. The altar of incense represents prayer. The table of showbread represents the study of God's holy word. 
And the candlestick which gives light represents the fact that God gives us the oil so that we can enlighten the world through His Spirit. In other words, we have what I call the triangle of sanctification. Prayer, Bible study, and witnessing, which leads to a balanced Christian life in a close relationship with Jesus. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, But we all, with unveiled face, beholding, as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord, what happens? Are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory just as by the Spirit of the Lord. In the book Sons and Daughters of God, page 337, Ellen White uh, amplifies and explains this text from 2 Corinthians 3.18. She says, by beholding Christ, by talking of Him, by beholding the loveliness of His character, we become changed. See, we're, we're contemplating the law in, live, in a living person. And then she says, changed from glory to glory. And what is glory, she asks? Character. And he becomes changed from character to character. Thus we see that there is a work of purification that goes on by beholding Jesus. So what is the secret for overcoming sin and having Christ imparted righteousness? He imparts it to us daily as we are in fellowship with Him through prayer, through Bible study, through witnessing, through contemplating Him and leaving everything else aside. Kind of reminds me of an experience that I had. You know, I taught theology for six years in our university in Medellin, Colombia. I had one student that was exceptional, the best student that I ever had. He would sit always on the first row with his Bible open, with his notebook, and when I started teaching the class, he would look at me, and he would not take his eyes off of me except to write down in his notebook what I was saying in class. Stellar student. Always got perfect grades. A few years ago, I was preaching in a certain place, and after I finished my sermon, by the way, I had this student for three years, a lady came to me. She said, Pastor Barr, do you know so-and-so? She mentioned the name of this student. I said, yeah, I sure do know him. She says, well, you preach just like he does. <laughs> and I looked at her like, smiled, and I said, well, you know, he was my student for three years. She says, oh, I'm sorry, Pastor. You know, she was kind of embarrassed. But I said, don't be embarrassed. I said, when you spend three years in a classroom beholding someone, you are changed. And even till this day, he came to one of our uh, retreats, family retreat, up in Yosemite National Park a few years ago. And my, my church members that went, I wasn't able to go, they came to me and said, Pastor Barr, he preaches just like you. He moves his arms like you. The tone of his voice is like you. The way he, that he moves his body is like you. He says, man, he's just like a copy. <laughs> Why? Because by beholding, we are changed. And this is a law of life. We are composed physically of what we eat. We are composed spiritually of what we eat. And we eat through our eyes and through our ears. And each day as we behold Jesus through prayer, through Bible study, through witnessing and talking about how wonderful He is, we are changed into His same image, into His same likeness. And His imparted character, the robe of His imparted righteousness comes into our life. We submit to Him. Our, His thoughts become our thoughts. His will becomes our will. His mind becomes our mind. And we are one with him. Amen. This is the reason why Ellen White said that it would be well for us to spend a thoughtful hour each day contemplating the life of Christ. Amen. And she says that as we do that, we will come, our love will be quickened, and we shall be more deeply imbued with his spirit. And we will come in penitence and humiliation to the foot of the cross. Amen.